Well, before we start this episode of the podcast, uh, an update on some Phillies news that happened after the main podcast was already recorded. The Phillies have placed Jared Eikhoff on the disabled list and say he'll be out six to eight weeks with a lat strain. I guess things are just going too well for us, weren't they? Eikhoff was lined up to be the team's number three starter, and while he hadn't had a good spring so far at a 7.36 ERA, I did feel good about his chances to bounce back this season, but now that's going to have to wait until late May, most likely. Eikhoff had a rough year last year, beset by injuries. He was looking to overcome those injuries this season, but now is going to start off 2018 trying to get over another one. Nick Pavetta is probably the biggest beneficiary from this news. He was lined up to be the number four before Arietta was signed. He'll certainly open the season in the big league rotation, and now it's possible one of Zach Eflin or Ben Lively will also be on the opening day roster, depending on how long it takes Jake Arietta to get himself ramped up and ready to go for opening, for opening week. So we'll be talking more about this on Sunday night's edition of Hit and Season with Justin Clue and Liz Rocher. That is available only for Patreon subscribers. Remember, you get those bonus podcasts by signing up, so go to patreon.com slash hit and season to hear that. Now, on to the rest of episode 182. Flag and drive! There it is! Number 500! The career 500 home run for Michael Jack Smith! Oh, yes. Rollins has won it! They stream out of the dugout! Yeah. Rollins by yeah. near third! This game is over! It is out of here! 50th home run of the year for Ryan Howard! Ruiz out to get it, the throw from his knees, it's in time! And it's a no-hitter! Unbelievable! Ruiz and Helen. Oh, it. Chase is going to keep going, and he's safe at home plate. Wow. Chase Utley, you are the man. Swing and a miss. Stuck him out. The Philadelphia Phillies are 2008 World Champions of Baseball. Now batting for the Phillies, second baseman John Stolas. Hey there, podcast pals, and welcome to Hitting Season. This is episode number 182. I'm your host, John Stolness from SB Nation's Phillies blog, The Good Fight. I also write about baseball for numberfire.com. You can follow me on Twitter at John Stolness, and you can follow the show on Facebook and Instagram as well. Coming up, I'm going to talk to Jason Stark, soon to be of The Athletic. The great Jason Stark was in Clearwater for the Jake Arrieta News Conference this week, and we'll get his thoughts on the signing and the team as a whole looking ahead here to 2018. Are we talking enough about Jorge Alfaro amongst us as Phillies fans here this offseason? And I'm going to give you my 25-man roster prediction, plus I will have your stat of the week. But first, just a couple of quick house, housekeeping notes, guys. Um, if you are interested in being an advertiser on Hit and Season, please feel free to email me, jstolness at gmail.com. Uh, we have, uh, I have all kinds of plans that could, that could work well for you. If you want to sync up your brand to the longest-running Phillies podcast in the Delaware Valley, wherever it is you happen to be listening to this podcast, and you want to sync up your brand with, the, with, with this podcast, then I would love to talk to you. So, again, hit me up on email. It's jstolness at gmail.com. Also, uh, if you love Phillies podcasts, and if you're listening to this one, I really, really hope you do, because otherwise I really don't know what you're doing with your time. Uh, we've got two additional Phillies podcasts for you on our Patreon site. Of course, as you know, we have set up a Patreon site uh, for the hit and, for hit and season. Um, one of the uh, bonus podcasts you'll get if you become a member of the $5 tier is a, an additional episode of Hit and Season that I record on Sunday nights with Justin Clue and Liz Rocher, both of The Good Fight. And also, you will get the unbelievably funny and awesome Phillies podcast that takes a look back at the 1993 and 2008 teams. It's, you know, big anniversaries for both those teams this summer. And uh, Justin and Liz will be chronicling those two seasons uh, with a podcast that will be recorded in the middle of the week. It's called Continued Success. They are two episodes in so far, and they are both hysterical you are missing out if you are not getting that podcast so again go to patreon.com slash hit and season or just go to patreon and do a search for hit and season and uh you can uh, you can join us you can be a member you can you can be a subscriber on the five dollar tier and get all of that good stuff right there now more on Jake Arrieta. And, you know, we are going to start focusing on some other players at some point here uh, during the 2018 season other than Jake Arrieta. But for now, he's still the big news. And 
of, of course, you heard me talk about Jake Arrieta with Justin and Liz on Sunday night. The team introduced him this week once the once the contract was made official. Um, and this was something interesting I, I saw from uh, from Jason Stark, who's going to be up with us in a few minutes. He tweeted this tidbit out from a, a Dave Shinen piece on the Jake Arrieta signing. The Phillies have guaranteed more money to free agents this offseason, $169.2 million, than the other four National League East teams combined. They combined for just over $116 million. And so um, if ever you needed proof that the Phillies were all in, they are all in right now, and it's really exciting. And it was exciting seeing Jake Arrieta in uh, red and white pinstripes. He had his first bullpen session on Wednesday. Uh, he had his introductory press conference with the team. I believe it was on Tuesday, and I've got some sound from that press conference here. Um, the thing you just you know, but you notice about Arietta is how well spoken he is, how smart he is, and how intense he is. You just you get the intensity. Seems to me a guy who's who he and Gabe Kapler are going to hit it off uh, in a big big way. And um, again, I, I really do feel like Arietta's philosophy on baseball is very similar to his managers. Uh, take a listen to what Arietta had to tell fans. I mean, if you listen to this and you don't get fired up, then then I don't know what to do for you. What we're going to do here is we're going to promise a fight. You know, there's no, there's no guarantee you're going to feel good or you're going to have your best stuff or you're going to get a great night's sleep the night before. But what we, what we can promise <clears throat> is that we're going to have conviction, we're going to fight, and we're going to win at the end of the day. So um, I couldn't be happier to be a Philly. And Arietta knows that even though the Phillies won 66 games last year, they are going to take a step forward here in 2018. I knew this was an organization that was hungry to win, and I knew that they were going to do the things necessary to take that next step. I knew the front office that was in place. I knew that ownership uh, had, a, had a tremendous hunger to, to put a winning team on the field. And uh, the young players that this organization possesses, uh, with a couple, a couple key additions, uh, there's no reason that this organization can't get back to the winning ways that they had uh, several years ago. General Manager Matt Clintack said at the news conference that having Arietta on board is really going to help this young staff out a lot. Jake's one of the best pitchers in baseball, and this is a big, big, big moment for our franchise, and we're all thrilled. I want to thank Jake uh, for choosing us. And Andy McPhail has told me for years, anytime you're in a negotiation, you got to remember that as much as you may be choosing uh, to, to target a player or somebody to come join you, that person's also choosing you. Um, and I, it, it does, it's not lost on me the significance that Jake Arrieta, one of the top pitchers in baseball, would choose and want to come to the Philadelphia Phillies. And manager Gabe Kapler likes what he's heard from Arrieta thus far, as you would imagine. Just listening to, to him talk about how it can't, it can't be fake, it comes with a high degree of preparation and determination. Just listening to him talk through how to create confidence, that alone is the perfect message for our, for our pitchers. This is going to be a, a pretty perfect marriage, what our players need from Jake and what Jake can bring to our clubhouse. So with just two weeks left until the regular season starts, and as I'm recording this podcast, it is two weeks until the team opens up their season in Atlanta. What is Arietta's schedule like? How ready is he going to be for opening week? Can he be ready for opening week? Well, the Phillies think so. He hopes to pitch in a minor league game on Saturday. Arietta does. Uh, pitching coach Rick Kranitz mentioned that the the righty will uh, for throw. He has to uh, first throw live batting practice uh, before that stuff happens. And either way, Arietta believes he will be ready for the first week of the regular season. Even though you know nothing has officially been you know ironed out just yet, they're not exactly sure how they're going to get there. But he, he'd been throwing on a regular basis uh, in you know get as he was working out in Texas before signing with the team. And because of off days early in the season, the Phillies will not need a number five starter until April 11th. So that could be the first time we see Jake Arrieta this, uh, uh, this regular season is uh, early April. It might be sooner, um, but that's probably the latest that, that I think uh, he would make his, his season debut. And, uh, you know, as we're talking about, about Jake Arrieta, we, um, we discussed Arrieta and all of the, the things that he could do for the 2018 season, but his 2017 season was one of the more interesting ones in baseball. And, it definitely the start to his season last year is one of the reasons why everyone was pes a little bit more pessimistic about him this off season, and it's probably why. As a matter of fact, I'm sure it's why he didn't get the type of offers that he was getting. But Ben Harris of the Athletic had a great piece out this week on Jake Arrieta's first and second half splits, noting 
In uh, 101 innings in the first half, he had a 4.35 ERA, and his uh, hit one of his signature pitches, the cutter slash slider, depending on the website, um, it, it varies what it's called, a cutter or slider. Whatever it was, it, it, it was in 2015 Arietta's best pitch. It was worth negative 10.4 runs. Um, it was 10.4 runs below the average starter's cutter slider last year, which was the least valuable in baseball. But that changed in the second half. He had a second half ERA of 2.28. His velocity was up a little bit, around 93 by year's end on average. And he did not allow more than three earned runs in any start from July 2nd until the end of the season. Now, he did all this with his batting average on balls in play going way down, his fielding independent pitching staying about the same, and his strand rate going up. But as Ben noted in his piece, take a look at the heat maps. They tell the tale of exactly what he was doing differently. He moved his fastball from the middle of the plate to low and away to right-handed hitters. His changeup went from the middle of the plate to low and in against righties. And his curveball and slider went from being in the strike zone, although toward the lower and outer half, towards almost exclusively out of the strike zone, but in a good way, in a deceptive way that he, he generated more swing and miss on those pitches and, and, and more weak contact on those pitches, which he was getting he was getting better pitchers' contact uh, which is one of the reasons why his batting average on balls and play went way down in the second half last year. And so, you know, I think if we look at Jake Arrieta, and I mentioned this, you know, in a podcast that I did with James Seltzer this week for their High Hopes podcast uh, that he does with John Marks and Jack Fritz, um, that really Arietta has pitched one bad half of baseball over the last three years. And he finished last year strong. And for some reason, that's not the last impression we have of Jake Arrieta. Jake Arrieta pitched really well in the playoffs for the Cubs last year. That's not the mental image we have of him. We have the struggling first half from him. And I, we'll see in 2018 which one plays out to be the more accurate gauge of his of his true ability right now. But, you know, I think you got to—I'm giving Arrieta the, the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to assume that he can put together another season like he did in 2016— which was not as great as 2015, but he was still one of the best pitchers in baseball in 2016. And in the second half of last year, when he was one of the best pitchers in baseball in the second half of the season last year. Most of the time, we look at starters as they're entering a new season, and we take a look at what they did most recently. And that would have been second half numbers. And for whatever reason with Arietta, we tend to focus on the first half numbers, on the struggles without realizing that first half was the aberration over the last three years. That it was the outlier, at least based on what we saw in 2015, 16, and 17. Again, we don't know what we're going to get from Jake Arrieta. He's now 32 years old. He's one year older than he was last year, if I'm doing the math correctly. And so, you know, we'll see what we get. But I think there, I think Ben's piece really laid it out in a, in a, very succinct way why we, we should feel optimistic about Jake Arrieta's chances of being a very good major league starter and, a, and a, a, an arm that's going to help this team hopefully battle for a wild card spot here in 2018. This ball is out of here! And joining me to talk about the Phillies and the Jake Arrieta signing is the great Jason Stark. Now with The Athletic, you can follow Jason on Twitter at JasonST. Jason, thanks so much for coming back on the podcast. How are you? John, I'm doing well. Um, I, we should clear up that I don't start at the athletic till April one, but I am raring to go, man. I keep Can't forgetting wait. that. I keep forgetting that it's not April yet. I really, honestly, <laughs> really, we're, we're, we're so walk in out the, your door. I know. I should. <laughs> Put that show snow, snow shovel away. And exactly. That works well for you. I'll tell you, here in, in the D.C. area, we this is where snow goes to die. I mean, it's been it's been cold, but at least we haven't gotten a single snowstorm this winter, which I'm thrilled about because I have like a I have a 40 mile commute in and out of work every day. So um, <laughs> but that's what it's, I think that's what's throwing me is because we're so at least I'm so immersed in, in, in baseball right now and kind of getting the season started and spring training underway. It feels like baseball season. It feels like April already. 
Uh, and we're getting close to it now, Jason. And, um, you know, as we get closer to opening day, it was a question mark whether or not the Phillies were going to do anything to improve the starting rotation. And then they went out and they signed Jake Arrieta, the best available free agent starter left on the market to the three-year $75 million deal. You were there uh, down in Clearwater the day he was introduced. Um, tell me a little bit about your observations from, from Arietta's arrival in camp and, and the signing and the press conference and all that. Well, I felt like it was interesting on two levels. One has to do with what he does for the Phillies in 2017. But the other part of it, it's probably the most interesting part of it for me, is the groundwork it lays for the free agent winner of 2018, which is going to be critically important for the franchise. So you tell me which you'd rather discuss first. <laughs> well, let's start. We'll, we'll take it chronologically. So first, let's start off with what's going to happen here in 2018 and and what he means for this starting rotation. For me, Jason, it, it, the most important thing it does, as far as I can tell, is take some of the pressure off of Aaron Nola and some of the younger starters like Eikhoff and Velasquez, who need bounce back seasons uh, this summer. Take some of the pressure off of those guys as far as I can tell well absolutely um it's I mean it's not just about pressure it's about performance it's about having a a, a guy who's one of the best pitchers in baseball when he's right um take the place of somebody who would just be uh, going out there because somebody has to pitch every night you know there's um beyond Aaron Nola you and I've talked about this Um, they have a lot of pitchers who are big league arms, Mm -hmm. but none who are top of the rotation or maybe even middle of the rotation, big league arms. Um, And so this is a massive upgrade on whoever was going to be the fifth starter. Um, And the question is how massive and what does it mean? Now, Jake Arrieta is not the same guy who won the Cy Young Award three years ago. Um, You know, his decline is easy to map out. We can do that if you want. But all right, let's just say that he is. Uh, that guy, um, judged by baseball references, wins above replacement, was worth eight extra wins. That mm. was Jake Arrieta doing his Bob Gibson imitation. Right. Uh, the projections on the 2018 Phillies that I've seen have ranged from 74 to 78 wins before they signed him. And so, I mean, what does that make them? Uh, to me, it doesn't make them a playoff team, but I think it makes them relevant. I think it gives them the capability to at least play meaningful games mm-hmm. deep into the season, uh, certainly into August. You'd like to think into September. And I mean, that was a big part of this. They, they've, this is so, such an important year, not just in terms of what it means um, in in the improvement of young players, but in the way it reverberates through the sport so that next winter people look at the Phillies players, they need to add and say, I want to be there. You know, like I'd never think it's a good idea to just start throwing money at whoever will take it. Is there anything to the thought process that Scott Boris is Jake Arrieta's agent and they worked out a deal here and, Scott Boris is Bryce Harper's agent, and I know uh, one of the things that Scott Boris said at the news conference welcoming Arietta was some, he made some kind of reference about hot coffee, which didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But the the impression is that the Phillies are the Phillies have kind of arrived as players here in the free agent market in in, in acquiring uh, big time talent. And one of your uh, your former colleagues at ESPN, Buster Olney, said a um, couple times uh, on uh, on on Wednesday that he'd bet the family farm that one of either Bryce Harper or Manny Machado comes to Philadelphia next year. Do you get the sense that, you know, it's something that is that likely to happen? And does, does Jake Arrieta's signing does, how much does that help? Well, it's funny. uh, Buster and I were, uh, we're we're hanging around, hanging around on the field um, before the game that day after the press conference. And it was hard not to notice how much time John Middleton and Scott Boris were spending with each other. Mm -hmm. they, They were inseparable for the good part of an hour. And if you know how Scott works, uh, he loves to connect with owners, go above GMs, go above free front offices, and make that appeal to the emotions of an owner who is whose heart is racing at the thought of winning. You tell me whether you think that would describe John Middleton. 
<laughs> I'm going to say yes. Yeah, I think so. I think <laughs> Not, so. Right. Now, I don't think that, to be honest with you, that Bryce Harper is the top name on their list. Mm-hmm. But could I see them signing Bryce Harper? Yeah, I could. And could I see Scott making that pitch to John Middleton uh, after, say, Manny Machado decides to go elsewhere? I could. Um, it's something to watch. Um, there, wor- there weren't a lot of teams spending money this winter. The Phillies spent more than every team except the Cubs, and most of the Cubs' money was tied up in one guy, Hugh Darvish. Yeah. So there's that. And, you know, when you, when, you, when you really analyze it, look past just spending, here's what I saw in this market. I saw a total lack of the normal emotion that we usually see heading into free agency where a team or an owner says, we need to make a splash. We need this guy, and I'm going to overpay to do that. That just didn't happen the whole off season for the most part. But now could you imagine John Middleton saying that to himself next winter? I totally can. You know, I, I mean, this, this line has gotten around, but he was telling me that uh, he had circled Jake Arrieta's name on his free agent list years right. ago, as soon as right. his free agent list came out, as a guy he wanted to sign. And then I think it was Todd Zalecki who was standing next to me, said, what names do you have circled for next winter? <laughs> good question. Good question, <laughs> he, Todd. It was a really good question. And he <laughs> laughed and he said, that's a conversation for another time. But trust me, they are circled. And I, look, I think every indication is that Machado's the top name on that list. He's the biggest, brightest circle. But... You don't think Bryce Harper's circles? Of course he is. Um, I, I, despite what we saw this winter, if you're ever going to see another monster deal, it's going to be to some guy who comes in, who comes out at 26 years old like Machado and Harper, right. and you could justify giving him eight or nine or ten years. I'm sure Scott's going to ask for 12 years times – I don't know, fifty million, right? right? So that that'll be six hundred million, and then when the when you actually get them signed for four hundred million, you think you got a bargain. Right, I've exactly. Seen this a few times. <laughs> exactly, you got a deal out of that. Absolutely no, and you know, here's the thing. I mean, and you you hit on it just a second ago. The the free agent market most of the time consists of players in their in their early to, to mid thirties, and here you've got two guys who are going to be in their mid twenties hitting the free agent market, and and two generational talents like this. You know, so I do think more teams are going to be willing to open up the the, the checkbook, but you, 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 a lot of the teams that we talk about, like the the Yankees and the Dodgers and and the Cubs, you know they they did a lot of work to get under the luxury tax here this off season, which is one of the reasons why um, they, for the most part, sat out paying big money. We did see Eric Hosmer, one of the few free agents in his twenties, get a long term deal. So I think the appetite is out there for teams to sign free agents to big deals as long as they feel like they're going to get more on the front end, maybe than what they were used to accept, what was used to being acceptable just even a couple of years ago on the front end. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Um, it's accurate again on a lot, on a lot of different levels. Um, it, clearly the, the, the game has changed so much and the, uh, the, the people who run the sport, the people who run their teams uh, are data driven. They've got, yeah, all the data that shows us something you'd think everybody would have figured out 40 years ago, which is that these long deals for guys who are in their prime or past their prime don't make sense. They don't make economic sense. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can argue they make sense in terms of uh, you know, what it does for the perception of the franchise, blah, 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 blah. But in terms of cold economic sense, the mathematics of those deals do not add up. And – this was the winner where the the folks who had the data to prove that could show it to their owners, and for whatever reason, those owners had the discipline to go down this road. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have seen a trend, and the Arietta contract was part of it, that I think plays into this. These contracts used to be backloaded. All of a sudden, we've seen a bunch that are front-loaded, yeah. and the Arietta deal is one of them. Uh, $75 million pays out $30 million year one, mm-hmm. $25 million year two, $20 million year three. And, uh, you know, John Middleton said his reasoning for that is not 
just about age. It's about they've got the money to spend now. They've got incredible payroll flexibility. They were, they were mm. probably or at least possibly going to have the lowest payroll in baseball before this deal. Yeah. And now um, if you front load $30 million of it in this off season, it leaves a tremendous amount of cash free to spend down the road. And he just made it. <laughs> right. It made it feel yeah. clear. It yeah. practically put up a billboard on I ninety five. We're gonna spend it, man. Yeah, we no, I can't wait to spend it. And it doesn't affect the luxury tax implications, but it certainly affects just out of pocket cash that the Phillies are, are gonna spend, which I guess to Middleton means as much as anything else. Um but you know, I think with the deal it was interesting that there was a, an extension put on that the Phillies could uh could um, eliminate the opt-out clause after two seasons, I guess if he pitches really well here in 2018 and 19, and extend the deal to five years. Do, it, I don't know if you know this or not, but is that something – we know that Arietta was looking for a longer-term deal, looking in the five- to six-year range. Even though the, the control over whether or not the deal is extended lies with the Phillies, is that kind of like part of the middle ground that they reached with Arietta that this could go to five years if he pitches well? Yeah, of course. Um, there, there were definitely some concessions made to him and to, and to Scott to, to try to show that if a, if he earns the right to have a, to, to have a five-year deal, if he's good enough, if he looks like he's healthy enough, then yeah, they're in all in. They, they don't mind. I think we've seen this winter when the deals they've handed out, they don't mind the money. They don't mind the yeah, dollars. Right. They mind the years. Right. And so um, I, I, it's hard to, in, in, it's hard for me to envision that after two years they'd be willing to pick up those last two years. Sure. I'd be really surprised by that. Me too. But it, 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 it's certainly at least a gesture. And then the other thing, and this was another thing that the owner talked about, is the $30 million in year one. There are only four pitchers in the whole sport making $30 million this year, and you've heard of them, right? <laughs> Clayton, Clayton Kershaw, Zach Greinke. David Price, and now Jake Arrieta. And that was another nod to saying, we still think you're one of the elite pitchers in the sport. And, you know, if a guy goes into free agency thinking he's going to get $200 million and he doesn't even get $100 million, um, Jake's a guy who's got a big chip on his shoulder anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that those are the kind of little things that help seal a deal. No, I, it's certainly, I, I think the, the numbers, I was expecting something in the, the three year 90 range, but uh, all the met different machinations there that, that they worked out seems to, seems to, like you said, be a nod to, to what Arietta wanted. And at the same time, giving the Phillies the flexibility to not be hamstrung by a contract with a guy who's going to be aging into his mid thirties here as we move along um, real quick, just a, a couple other things uh, from Phillies camp. Um, you know, I don't. I want to get your impressions on Scott Kingery. I know you probably haven't seen a lot of him in person this year, but obviously the team is very high on him, and they're playing him all over the place. And we're Phillies fans are obviously very excited about Kingery and and what he could be. But there's obviously a logjam right now at the major league level. How do you see the Kingery thing working out? They're going to send him down to start the season to you know gain that extra year of team control, but. You know, once that once that hurdle is cleared, can you see them bringing him up as kind of a, a super utility Ben Zobrist ish type guy, or do they want him to continue to get regular at bats in AAA? Um, I I would say that any buzz you've heard about him coming back here in mid to late April is backed up by reality. I think they've they've discussed that long and hard, and um, he's done nothing this spring to dissuade them from thinking that's. That's an excellent idea. And um, I don't know if he can be Ben Zobrist, right? Because look around the outfield. Um, you know, they're already trying to find enough playing time for four guys yeah. and, and divvy that up. And so I don't know how much outfield playing time is there for him. Right. And first base is certainly carved up. But I, I do think that that is a definite possibility where he's back here and he bounces around, he plays some second, he plays some third, he plays a little short, he plays a little outfield, and they find playing time for him. And then in July, trade Cesar Hernandez, assuming that Cesar uh, does what he's <laughs> supposed to do and, and continues to make the progress he's made the last two years. So that's what I think. He's a, he, he's a super utility guy for a couple of months and then becomes a regular second baseman at some point. 
as far as Mike call Franco goes, I think one of the one of the areas that they could move Kingery is at third base if Franco struggles. How much of a leash do you think he has this year with the team? Um, he's on there. He's definitely on their radar screen as a guy who has to get it done or else. And you'd think he would know that. Uh, it would seem to be clear. He's tried to make a bunch of adjustments this spring. Mm-hmm. You know, I was there the other day. He he was three for thirty in the spring. Yeah. Uh, until he got uh, hits and two at bats in a row. And when yeah. I brought that up to Gabe Kapler afterwards. He said they they were not concerned about the three for 30 part that they were really happy with the adjustments that he's been making, uh, that they would never use exit velocity in spring training to, to show anything. But if you looked at his exit velocity in spring training, you'd see how hard he was barreling up the ball. And I don't know, does this sound familiar to you? I've been hearing, (laughs) I've been hearing for two years about his exit velocity and, uh, his batting average and balls in play uh, to indicate, here's a guy, with he's young, he's got great ability, he's still hitting the ball hard, uh, he's just being, quote-unquote, unlucky. Well, this is the longest streak of bad <laughs> luck. I can remember, <laughs> for the last year and a half, yeah. he's in the bottom two in the, in the league in on-base, slugging, and OPS. And you just can't have a continuation of that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I well, think... The, the problem is... Got, go, go ahead, Jason. Better. Yeah, he's, he's got to be better. He does. He's got to be driven to be better. Yep, absolutely. And the pro- his problem is not that he doesn't make weak contact. It's he, he hits everything on the ground. He doesn't hit enough. He doesn't have enough balls in the air. He, I think he hit uh, you know forty five percent ground ball rate. That was among the right. the top third in baseball. You know, he keeps pulling. He keeps rolling over uh, pitches on the outside part of the plate on the left side of the infield. It's one of the reasons he yep. hit so many double plays last year. You can barrel as many balls up as you want. If you're hitting them on the ground and you're as slow as Michael Franco is, you are not going to have a whole lot of luck. Ground balls are outs. Yes, for him. Right. I mean, in, in, in the land of the, uh, of the mega shift, which is where we are now with mm-hmm. thousands and thousands of shifts every, every year, if you pull the ball on the ground, I, I think the figure I saw was you hit 189, something like that. And uh, he just does too little of that. Um, they've tried to make some some major adjustments to get – him to hit more balls in the air. And he did hit a home run the other day off Chris Archer. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that. He's really um, closed up his stance the last couple of days, Jason. He's almost like – He's he, done yeah. – yeah, he's done that. He is – I mean, the one thing that, that's hard not to notice is his helmet is not flying off his head Good. every time he takes a swing. And, I, look, I understand what they see. He's got the same – he had the same average exit velocity last year as Mike Trout – and Nolan Arenado, right? right? Those mm-hmm. guys, however, hit the ball in the air. Mm-hmm. He doesn't do it enough. Right. But, you know, if he, he's also got a 294 on base the last two years, and the only guy in the league who's been lower is Freddie Galvis. So, I mean, they're hoping that the Carlos Santana plate discipline thing is going to help him. The last I looked, he'd walk one time the whole spring, though. Yeah. And, uh, and they're hoping that these swing adjustments he's trying to make with John Malley, the new hitting coach, are going to allow him to lift the ball. But uh, like me personally, I, I've only seen two games. I haven't seen that, but stay tuned. Yep. Last question for you, Jason. Um, if the Phillies are kind of hanging around the, the 500, the wild card periphery come trade deadline time, how aggressive do you think they'll be? And uh, do you think – one of the guys that uh, could rejoin this team in the second half to help make a push is uh, our old pal Cole Hamels. Uh, I don't think the Rangers are going to be a contender. I could be wrong on this. They're really hard to evaluate just looking at their roster. There's a big swing on what they could be. But Mm -hmm. if they're not, Cole's a free agent. Uh, He'll be available. And I I think the Phillies are looking for opportunities, Um, whether they're looking for short-term opportunities I'm not so certain about that. Um, what I think is they're looking for pieces to put in place <clears throat> long term. Yeah. It's why you know Jake Arrieta made sense to them on a three-year deal because they were looking f- for a pit. I mean, they've gone into this winter thinking they wanted a pitcher they could control for three plus years, and you know the, the plus part depended on who it was and the age and the various factors. And I really think that'll still be the game plan in July, to not trade for Reynolds. But 
get back to me in July. I mean, if they're yeah, right. 15 games over 500 and they've got a real opportunity, then that's a different story. But I, I think they're still looking way more at the long-term arc than the 2018 arc. Well, that's the smart move. We've heard Matt Klintak say that. He wants to be a playoff contender for 10 years, um, not just three or four. And so um, it's exciting. I, hopefully, you know, the 2018 season is the springboard to that, um, to what he's been talking about. And it certainly has uh, Phillies fans excited. Um, and I was excited to talk to you again, Jason. Thanks so much for coming back on. Jason Stark, soon to be of The Athletic. Again, you can follow Jason on Twitter at Jason ST. Jason, thanks for coming back on Hitting Season. Always great to be on with you, John. Thanks for having me, man. This ball is out of here. Well, one of the things I don't think I talked about enough in the podcast that I did with Justin and Liz last Sunday night when we celebrated the arrival of Jake Arrieta is I'm not sure we gave the Phillies front office enough credit for the offseason that, that, that they've had that culminated with the Arietta signing. I mean, what they've done this offseason, signing these four free agents, is – a complete 180 from what they've done the last few off seasons when the rebuilding process was in the midst of its drudgery. And now we, that the, I feel like the rebuilding process is over. They're, they're now kind of entering the window of contention as signaled by the free agent signings this off season. I think it's time to, to tip our hat to Matt Klintak and Andy McPhail and, and John Middleton and the rest of the Phillies front office who collectively all did a great job making these things happen. I mean, so let's grade the offseason. How well did Matt Klintak do? Because, you know, I think as we start off with the Jake Arrieta deal, obviously a huge move both for the roster on, and, uh, and, and uh, for the performance on the field. It was a good move symbolically and X's and O's wise. And as, as, age, as uh, Arrieta's agent Scott Boris noted at the news conference, that the Phillies are now going to be seen as players around baseball. Talked about this with Jason just a few minutes ago. Um, I also think it's going to help, help take some of the pressure off Aaron Nola. Because Aaron Nola doesn't have to feel like he has to be, you know, he has to do do more than he can do um, every time he goes out there. He has a running buddy now that can help him out. And the contract specifically, I, I know when Liz talked about it on Sunday night, her, her view of the contract was taking a look at it from Arietta's perspective. And we've been doing that a lot this offseason because we have seen what a weird and crazy offseason this has been with the lack of free agents being signed. And this did feel like a deal Jake Arrieta probably didn't want to sign. He was looking for something longer term than this. Now, even amongst, even in a normal off season, it's, it's entirely possible Jake Arrieta doesn't get the deal that he wants because what I think he wanted was too many years and too much money. The deal that he signed with the Phillies for three years and 75 million, I thought 390 was going to be the, was going to be the deal, but three at 75 is a fair deal. I think. Uh, for both sides, it gives Jake Arrieta a $30 million payday in his first season, which, as Jason mentioned a minute ago, makes him one of, what, a handful, four or five pitchers in baseball making $30 million this season. And it, it, it does demonstrate the fact that as he gets older these next couple of years, his performance will likely decline. Front offices were not interested in giving players, especially players with draft pick and international money compensation penalties being included in these signings, and those have to go away with the next collective bargaining agreement. These free agents will, will – guys like Alex Cobb and Greg Holland who are still on the outside looking in, teams don't want to sign them because they got to give up draft picks to sign them. They have got rid of the first-round draft pick compensation, but even second- and third-rounders, teams don't want to give them up, and they don't want to give up the international money required. So – that needs to be addressed. There are a million things that need to be addressed in the next CBA. It probably will result in a player strike, which I will support the players in a player strike because the financials of this game need to change. You need to incentivize teams not to be so quick to rebuild. When the Phillies started rebuilding, they kept their window jammed open as long as humanly possible. And so to me, that's not tanking. They, ra they rode that team as long as they possibly could until they had to rebuild. And, and so that's why the, what the Phillies did, I think, was a standard rebuild. But you're seeing a lot of teams hit the rebuild button much sooner than you would think because you have these super teams, and teams are incentivized to build, build rosters full of young players because they're so cheap. The next CBA has to focus on paying young players more, moving free agency up in a player's career instead of six years, make it make it restricted free agency after the third year and full free agency after the fourth year, like you see in the NBA. I, I think that's the direction we're going, and I think the players need to hold out and strike if need be until that happens. That's going to be best for everybody in the game. So I understand coming out the Arietta contract 
looking at it and saying, man, this guy didn't get what he wanted. You know, it's probably it, it's probably it is a pay cut for Arietta, But again, his skills are probably going to be declining. And we have been asking front offices to look forward with free agent contracts and not pay for past performance. And that's what this contract with Jake Arietta does. It looks forward. And if he does do well, there is the flexibility there to extend him to make it a five-year deal. Jason Stark noted that um, that contingency was probably part of a compromise reached by both sides. And if he is traded moving forward, he does receive an extra million dollars every time he's traded. So there is financial compensation if he does get moved to another team. So I think this deal was was obviously a great job done by Matt Klintak and Andy McPhail. It got the Phillies a premier starting pitcher at a price that they could that they could live with, and it was obviously at a price that Jake Arrieta could live with. And again, by, baseball's financial system is broken. It needs to be fixed. But under the current rules, given what the Phillies had to do right now, I think they did a fantastic job meeting Arrieta's needs and meeting their own long-term needs as well. And then you have the Carlos Santana signing a deal that by all accounts fell into their lap when Santana's price came down to three years. And again, a three-year $60 million deal, that's a lot of money to pay for a guy who's not a prodigious home run hitter. But he does what they want this lineup to do, hit well. He's a switch hitter. He hits well. He gets on base well. He does have some power. I think we'll see more home runs from him now that he's in a, a better hitter's park. It did give the Phillies a surplus of outfielders, so it wasn't a move that they had to make this offseason. But it was the first sign, too, that... They were looking at players to help build this team over the next three and four years, not just at one-year stop gaps like we had seen with this team with Michael Saunders and Howie Kendrick and with the pitchers they had been bringing in, Charlie Morton and Chad Billingsley. This was a sign that the team was looking ahead, looking forward, and realizing that the window for winning baseball games had actually arrived sooner than expected. And three years and $60 million, it's a great signing for Santana. If he had waited any longer than that to sign, he would have been um, probably where Logan Morrison was, which is a um, a cheap one-year deal. And frankly, I don't know that Logan Morrison didn't have a better season than Carlos Santana last year. Santana has a longer track record, which is why he gets the bigger deal. But again, this was a deal I think that worked out very well for both sides. And then you have the two relievers, Pat Nashak and Tommy Hunter. Uh, Hunter gets a two-year $18 million deal. Nashak two years at $16 million. Nashak apparently left more money on the table with other clubs because he wanted to sign with the Phillies. They gave Hunter probably more than he should have gotten. But listen, in today's baseball world, building a stable bullpen is a huge key. And at the time, the Phillies' rotation consisted of Jared Eikhoff in the two spot and Vince Velasquez in the three spot with a combination of rookies and second your guys in spots numbers four and five so adding hunter and nashak brought the bullpen two established pieces to help in the late innings and take some of the pressure off with hector naris luis garcia edibre ramos and adam morgan those guys don't have to be as locked in as they were at the end of the year right away because you figure hunter and nashak is going to ease the pressure on those guys so in that way it, it helped it helped lengthen out the rotation a little bit. They can go with an eight man rotation now. I mean an eight man bullpen and uh and, and you can uh you, you can you can deal with some shorter outings from Velasquez and if it's Nick Pavetta in the number five spot, Nick Pavetta. Again again, moves that show this team is ready to compete now, that they recognize that having a strong bullpen is vital to having a successful team. So Listen, I'm not a fanboy, you know. I'm well, listen. I am a fanboy, but I'm not. I am not afraid to criticize this team when it needs to be criticized. And I feel like I take an objective look at the moves this team makes, and that I'm not a pie in the sky optimist when it comes to the Phillies. But I don't see how you can look at this off season and give the Phillies a grade other than an A. I really don't. I mean, they they filled the needs that they had to have, and they they showed that they are that the, they believe the window is open. They're not punting on 2018, that they think they can win some games here in 2018. They have set themselves up to be a wild card team, which is all you could have asked for. And all of the moves that they've made make sense in retrospect. Even the Carlos Santana signing, a move they didn't have to make, does make them better. It makes them stronger. It gives them more flexibility now at the trade deadline, too, to move an extra outfielder if they want to get a, a, a rental starting pitcher like Cole Hamels. It gives them that flexibility. So they've set themselves up for this year. They've set themselves up for the next three years. They've also set themselves up to do, to do whatever they want after this offseason. None of these contracts are going to hinder them in any way from doing anything they want 
over the next few years. So this offseason has to be an A for the Phillies. There's just no other grade that makes sense. Any other grade is just you're looking to find fault with something. And I just don't think you can find fault with any of the moves Matt Clintech, Andy McPhail, and John Middleton made this offseason. So congratulations to the Phillies front office. You did everything that I could have I could have wanted you to do here over the winter. This ball is out of here. Well, this offseason we've talked a lot about J.P. Crawford. We've talked a lot about Reese Hoskins. We've talked some about Nick Will. Williams, and we've talked some about Scott Kingery, all these young position players that obviously, for good reason, have taken up a lot of our attention and our focus. But one of the prospects I really don't think we have been talking enough about is Jorge Alfaro. We just, for whatever reason, and, and I don't know what it is, he just kind of slips into the back of our minds. And I think we need to be talking about Jorge Alfaro quite a bit more than we have because he was probably the centerpiece of the Cole Hamels deal. He was the position player, more so, I think, than Nick Williams, who the Phillies really coveted in that in that deal. And we are seeing from Jorge Alfaro, we saw it last year in his cup of coffee with the team in which he hit very well, and we've been seeing it so far this spring. This guy has some serious ability, and he seems to be improving which is what you hope for in a young player. And he is going to be this team's starting catcher this year. Now, I'm not going to look at – I'm going to read you his spring numbers, and I certainly don't think he's going to replicate this over the regular season, what he's doing in the spring. And in just 25 at-bats, you can – I mean, he had a, a, a long hitless streak uh, here in the spring, but a couple of good games brings these numbers right up. But he's played 11 games this spring, 25 at-bats, and he's hitting 280 with a 379 on base percentage and a 560 slugging percentage. It's a 939 OPS this spring with two homers and six RBIs. He's only struck out seven times in 11 games this spring, just seven times in 25 at bats um, with one walk. So seven strikeouts and 26 plate appearances so far for Alfaro. You'd like to see some more walks, but listen, Alfaro is never going to be a high walk guy. What you want from Alfaro is to do damage on pitches that come over the plate, and that's what he's done so far this spring. Um, you know, he's he has shown real power, and I think his defense has looked better this year. I, there, were, there was one game I saw him where I think he stole a couple of pitches with pitch framing for his pitcher. I forget who the starter was, but there was a 3-1 count on one hitter where – he set up in such a way that there was a pitch that I thought was inside that the umpire called for strike two, and then I think it was Jared Eikhoff, and then Eikhoff got the hitter with a with a curveball for strike three. If, if Alfaro doesn't frame that pitch up, it's a walk. But instead, the pitcher gets out of the inning with a strikeout, and that's the kind of thing we're talking about with pitch framing, that a catcher can really help a pitcher out. And that's what they are training Alfaro to do. That's what the Phillies are working hard with all of their catchers to do. One of the things they talk about with Alfaro is he rock back and forth when he was in his crouch. Ben Davis talked about this on the on the broadcast uh, a couple days ago, and uh, getting Alfaro to to be a still target behind the plate has been a big key. He's also shortened up his his throws to to second. We I mean he has a hose. Jorge Alfaro's strength has always been a strong throwing arm, but it was a kind of like with a quarterback when you have a a, a long delivery. That's kind of what Alfaro had when he would deliver the ball to second or to third. He'd been able to mask that throughout his young career with a strong arm, but getting him to have a quicker release behind the plate has been something we have seen this spring, and he has thrown a few base runners out and uh, picked some guys off, and he's just got all the talent in the world, and I think he can be a decent power-hitting catcher this year. I mean, I don't think he's going to hit 280, and I don't think he's going to have an on-base percentage of 380, and I don't think he's going to hit a slug 560, but I would certainly think... Can, can Alfaro hit 250 this year? Yeah, I think so. Can he have an on-base percentage around 310, 320? I think that's probably doable. And can he have an, can he have a slugging percentage around 450, 475? For a rookie catcher and hit 15 to 20 home runs, I will take that all day from Jorge Alfaro, especially if he's going to improve his defense for a rookie. Because you would think from there he builds on that in, 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 in following seasons, in 2019 and 2020. And one of the things he did this offseason is he, he trimmed 12 pounds off his body, reported in at 238. He's, he's lighter, which has made him more agile behind the plate. Um, and it, they say his footwork on his release to second has been smoother. The receiving hand is, is you know, still still needs a little bit of work, but just the exchange from glove to hand has, has gotten better. He's making improvement, and one of the things you hear about Alfaro is he's such a teachable kid. He listens to instruction, and he's able to utilize it. And so I think, I think 
when we're talking about players who can be real impact players for this team moving forward, we don't talk enough about we don't talk enough about Jorge Alfaro and what he can be. Um, and I think he can be a productive catcher at the plate this year in in a lot of different ways. I think he might actually be a good sleeper candidate in uh, in fantasy baseball if you're looking to not have to spend on a catcher early. Maybe you take him with one of your last picks in in a two catcher league or a national league only league. Alfaro is a great choice, but I mean, I do, I, I think Alfaro is going to have a pretty decent season here in 2018. He's not going to be an all star. He's not going to be great. He's going to he's going to go long periods of time where he struggles at the plate. He's not going to walk very much, but I I, I think you're going to see some some pretty good power of game from from Alfaro this year, and I think his defense is going to get better as the season goes on. So a guy I'm I'm getting more excited about every day I see him is Jorge Alfaro. This ball is out of here. All right, before we get out of here and I give you the stat of the week, let me give you what I believe is going to be the 25-man roster for the Phillies. Again, we are two weeks out. The Phillies had an off day on Thursday, so it's a good time good time to kind of evaluate this. And uh, here is my 25-man roster. This is the team that I think the Phillies are going to take north, north with them to Atlanta. Uh, you've got the obvious uh, starting eight. Jorge Alfaro at catcher. Carlos Santana at first, Cesar Hernandez at second, J.P. Crawford at shortstop, Michael Franco at third, Reese Hoskins, Odubel Herrera, um, and I'll, th- I'll throw Nick Williams in there as uh, as the starter in right field for right now. Andrew uh, Knapp is your backup catcher. Aaron Altair is your fourth outfielder. Roman Quinn, your fifth outfielder, and Jezwell Valentin uh, will be your utility infielder slash outfielder. I think the Phillies are going to go with a four-man bench. I think they're going to go with an eight-man bullpen. I'll get to the bullpen in a second. Rotation is set. Aaron Nola, Jake Arrieta, Jared Eikhoff, Vince Velasquez, and Nick Pavetta. And in the bullpen, I think most of these guys are pretty obvious. I think it just comes down to one pitcher, really, in the pen. Hector Neris, Pat Nashak, Tommy Hunter, Luis Garcia, Adam Morgan, Edobre Ramos. I think Mark Leiter Jr., the way he's pitching, is going to be in the bullpen. And I think... For your, your your last guy, Hobie Milner probably has the inside track. The Phillies will probably want to take a second lefty. As unimpressive as Milner's stuff can be sometimes, he got results last year, and he's pitched well so far this spring. For, you know, he's probably the last guy in the bullpen that you use, but he, he's another lefty, so you hope that he can at least get the occasional left-hander out if you if you have him in the pen. Now, all bets are off when it's when Scott Kingery, um, they decide to bring him up. They might decide to go with a five-man bench and a, a seven-man bullpen, but I think they open the season with an eight-man bullpen, and that is my 25-man roster that I believe the Phillies will break camp with in a couple weeks. This ball is out of here! And now it's time for your stat of the week. The Phillies' offense has gotten off to a slow start this spring. And while it's important to note it's just spring training, and I don't really think we need to consider seriously spring training offensive numbers, I do want to pass these numbers along because the offense has struggled so far here in the first few weeks, and I'm kind of hoping they they turn it around a little bit here in the last two weeks of the spring. Their 230 team batting average this spring is the lowest of any team in baseball. Their 296 on base percentage this spring is also the lowest. Their 372 slugging percentage is second worst only to the Nationals. Their 665 OPS is the lowest in baseball. Their 16 home runs are tied for fourth fewest. Their 48 walks are fewest. Oddly, their pitching staff hasn't been bad. A 4.12 ERA overall for the staff is ninth best. The starter's ERA of 4.89 is 14th. The relievers so far, 3.75. That is fifth best in spring training so far. Again, these are spring numbers. They don't mean anything. Um, but what if they do mean something? <laughs> I think the offense is going to be fine this year. But uh, I would like to see them hit just a little bit here over the last couple of weeks of spring training. Just, uh, I don't know, just maybe for, to give them uh, a little bit of momentum uh, as the team heads north to Atlanta here in exactly two weeks from today. Folks, that'll do it for this edition of Hit and Season. My thanks to Jason Stark for coming on the podcast this week. If you haven't done so already, gang, please head on over to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to Hit and Season. Tell a friend about it if they're Phillies fans and they like podcasts. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, while you're at Apple Podcasts, if you would give the show a five-star review and a rating there, 
that would help the podcast grow, help other Phillies fans find it, and hopefully move us up those Apple Podcast Sports rankings. Uh, also, if, again, if you're interested in advertising on Hit and Season, uh, please feel free to email me, jstolness at gmail.com. And don't forget to become a Patreon uh, member of Hit and Season. Uh, getting on that $5 tier gets you our the bonus episode of Hit and Season with just Justin Clue and Liz Rocher and myself, and also gets you their fantastic Phillies podcast called Continued Success. Two episodes in, hysterical stuff. Again, go to patreon.com slash hit and season uh, to get all of the good stuff that we have to offer. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'll talk to you all next time right here on Hitting Season. Yeah.